One of the reasons I don't do daily content is because when you have to produce a video every single day and you're just one person, you often don't have time to deep dive into content that's a little bit more, that that needs a little bit more care. And so I have such a story that you might have heard of, the story of a girl named Brooke Skyler Richardson, who allegedly got pregnant while she was in high school. She carried out the pregnancy without telling anybody, and on the day of the birth, she killed her baby and then buried it in the backyard of her parents' house. This trial has picked up a lot of popularity over the past couple weeks because, one, it's been entirely televised and publicized. The judge was nice enough to allow cameras into the courtroom so that all of us can see this uh, fiasco play out. But also, it is extremely reminiscent of the Casey Anthony case where the person obviously did it, but still got away with it. This case begged a lot of big questions, which is why I'm glad I put the extra effort and spent two whole days researching this, because there were a lot of things that didn't make sense. Like the, the first big question that I had was how did she even hide her pregnancy from people that she knew? Because, you know, after a certain number of months, certainly you can hide a pregnancy for a couple months, but after about the third or fourth month or so, you start showing. And it's not like she was overweight. She was a thin cheerleader. So it would have been very obvious But her parents didn't even know, well, her mother was the first person to find out. Her parents didn't even know until she was almost ready to give birth. And even then, she was able to deny that she was pregnant and her mother believed her. Take a look at this photo. This is a picture of her in her prom dress just a few days before she gave birth to her her daughter. If you had shown me the picture of this and I didn't know she was pregnant, I would have said that she's not pregnant. She's very, very thin, and I forget the exact reason they gave for why she wasn't showing, but it was likely due to the fact that she's anorexic. In fact, it was so hard to tell that she was pregnant that she didn't even know until she went to the gynecologist to get some birth control only 11 days before the baby was delivered. And I actually believe her on this, despite the fact that I don't believe her on a lot, because if she was going, if she knew she was pregnant and she decided that she wanted to kill a baby, it would be a crucial mistake to go to the doctor and notify them that you were pregnant because that is how she ended up getting caught. What happened was is that she went to the gynecologist to go get some birth control. During that gynecology visit, they gave her a pregnancy test. She tested positive for that. And then they asked her to come back in a few days or however long it was to get a a follow-up appointment to determine how far along the baby was, but also to determine if the baby was healthy in the first place. One of the major points of contention in the case was if the baby was a stillbirth or not. And the problem with that is that the defense's only evidence that says it was a stillbirth is Brooke's own testimony. Brooke is an 18-year-old at this point, has really no medical knowledge about anything relating to children, yet she's able to diagnose her baby as stillborn and then bury the baby in the backyard. If she had gone back to the gynecologist and she'd come back for a second measurement, because that's That's how they determine the health of the baby is they take an initial measurement uh, at week one and they take a second measurement at week two and they compare based on what a healthy baby should look like. So if she had gone back and the gynecologist had determined the baby to be healthy, then she wouldn't have gotten away with the lie that the baby was still born. And I say it's a lie because if she actually cared about her child and she actually cared about her daughter like she claimed she did in the interviews, then she would have gone back for the follow-up appointment. If she actually cared about the child and was not trying to cover up a murder, when she found the child to be stillborn, like she told the police during the interrogation, when she found the child to be stillborn, then she would have called 911. She would have asked her parents for help. She would have done something to help save this baby's life in the case that the life could be saved. But she didn't do that. She went outside and buried the child and tried to pretend like nothing ever happened. Roughly two months after her first visit to the gynecologist where she was told she was pregnant, she goes to the same clinic, but to a different doctor to get a refill on her birth control. Now, I initially thought this would be a really stupid idea to go back to the doctor after you just murdered a baby, but the idea was that she didn't want anybody to know that she was pregnant and she had a boyfriend at the time. Imagine she was on birth control, having unprotected sex with her boyfriend, and she all of a sudden runs out and now says that her boyfriend has to wear a condom. I think he would find that quite suspicious, so she had to go back to the gynecologist to get more birth control. So she goes to the same clinic that she went to the first time, Hilltop Obstetrics and Gynecology. She first spoke to a doctor named William Andrew, 
and next spoke to a female doctor, Casey Boyce. What Brooke didn't know is that before the appointment, uh, the the two gynecologists had talked to each other, and then William Andrew had informed her current doctor, Casey Boyce, that uh, Brooke had been pregnant. So the doctor asked, well, hey, how's the baby? And she said this uh, very lucid statement, oh, I had the baby, it was stillborn, and I buried it in my backyard, and I didn't tell anybody, and the only person who knows is you. Sounds a little psychotic, but that's what she said. And did she give you any indication as to what happened to the child that she was pregnant with on April 26th? Yes, she started sobbing, and she said, I had it alone in my house, and I buried it in my backyard. After she said that to her doctor, they reported to the police, and then she got called in for an interrogation. So because of that, I don't think she actually knew that she was pregnant, or she wouldn't have told them. She was so insistent on not having anybody know that she was pregnant that she wouldn't have gone to the doctor and notified him that she was pregnant by getting that test if she had known she was pregnant beforehand. She would have refused it or she would have not shown up and just waited until the baby was born so she can get rid of it. Now, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of probably the majority of the YouTube audience who has viewed this case, because it's all been very, very public, like you can go and view every single court hearing, you can view all the interrogations all online, which is great. Makes it really easy to investigate this stuff. But personally, I think she is completely guilty. However, in case you haven't seen the end results of this, she got acquitted of all of her major charges. She got acquitted of a murder charge. She got acquitted of an involuntary manslaughter charge, which were the two big things that she was worried about. I mean, she did get convicted of mutilation of a corpse, which I believe is a felony, but that's not nearly as bad of a charge as murder is. And her being acquitted of the major charges is really why I spent a, a ton of time trying to absorb as much about this case as possible. I listened to the interrogations. I listened to a lot of the trial. I listened to all of the data that I thought was essential because I certainly didn't want to make a video condemning someone who may have been innocent. But despite the fact that I think she was guilty, she still won the case. And because she won the case, I'm going to talk about the defense first before I get into the prosecution. Because I want to discuss why I think she won and why I think her defense did actually a very, very good job. Her, both her lawyers were excellent, and I think especially the lawyer who gave the, the closing argument was phenomenal. I mean, if I, if I committed a murder, I would definitely hire this guy. And by the way, I believe Skyler has a stillbirth, but what I have got to do, my job, is to explain the burden of proof. As the judge talked to us in Lord Dyer, about 100 people, and if 99 are guilty and one is innocent, our law... People have fought for this. Our soldiers have fought to keep us a free country for our Fifth Amendment rights. Our law would prefer to let all 100 go than to entrap an innocent. That's why we have this high burden of proof in criminal cases. This guy is a master of public speaking. If anybody is interested in becoming a public speaker or anybody is a public speaker and wants to become better, then I would highly recommend that you watch the closing argument, his entire... I think it's like 45 minutes or an hour speech on why his client is not guilty. He does a phenomenal job at it. He's like making eye contact with a jury. He's got like a a kind of a, an even voice. It's not too quiet. It's not too loud. It's very like friendly. Like I'm just trying to help you out. Just make, my, make, make it so my client's not guilty. He gives lots of metaphors that are spot on and fantastic. Like I swear, this guy isn't even real. He's like out of a movie or something like that. His arguments are, are too good. He's... He's clearly had a lot of practice at this compared to his opponents who just aren't on the same skill level of debate and of presentation. And this is something that's important to point out because a lot of times people will win debates based on their skill level at debate and not based on the correctness of their arguments. I think a really good example of this is the whole debate between JonTron and Destiny that happened a couple years ago where Destiny gave a lot of really well thought out arguments about socialism and about things that are really abhorrent. And JonTron, though he had the correct idea, his presentation of those ideas are so terrible that nobody would have thought that the ideas were correct. But they started doing this thing where they were like, well, if you're black, you're here. If you're white, you're here. If you're, you know, they, okay, they so basically... That, that, so I would say that Jim Crow laws probably assigned white and black people to different areas more so than 
a Black Lives Matter speaker or Obama talking about a racial issue. I just don't know that it's on the same level, especially because- Well, it's not. It's on a much lesser level than it used to be. We don't have you, Jim Crow laws anymore. We don't, you know, women's suffrage happened, you know. Like, you're right, and people still manage to create divisions between themselves. Well, because there still exist divisions. Black people are disproportionately represented in prisons. Women are disproportionately represented in certain workplaces. Okay, you know, but the argument is that it's white people who caused them to be in those places. That's the that's the implicit argument, not that they have any agency of their own to Who have... do you think was responsible for Jim Crow laws? Well, of course it was it was white people, of course. I'm not arguing sure. for Jim Crow. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you go back 50 to 100 years, yeah, it was kind of white people that did it. Now, I'm not saying that we need to lock white people up now or bring back reparations or anything, but... They say you want to have a conversation, but they don't really want to have a conversation. They just want to blame whites more and more. Now, let me just quickly respond to this, because this is an argument that leftists give a lot. Japan was war-torn in the 1940s. They got nuked. They had all their crap burned. People were starving. People had pretty terrible lives after that war. A handful of year, years later, certainly a lot less time than uh, it's been from now to uh, back to the Civil War in America, a handful of years later, Japan is one of the world's greatest economies. There are many people who come from terrible situations, yet manage to find success. In fact, coming from a terrible situation tends to be a pretty big motivator for working hard. Now, why that's not happening in these specific communities that Destiny mentioned, uh, probably welfare, but that's a topic for another day. And this is just here to show you how wrong you can look when you're less skilled at debate than your opponent is. But let's get back to Brooks' case. And I guess at this point, for clarity, I'll start using their actual names. And the main lawyer that you see for the defense, the one who gives the closing argument, is named Charlie Rickers. The next lawyer I'm going to show you is the first lawyer that gives the closing argument for the prosecution. There's actually two prosecuting lawyers. Her name is Julie Kraft. And as I play this clip, take a second to look at the skill difference as a presenter between Charlie Rickers and Julie Kraft. It's quite noticeable. Even if I don't play them back to back, you can tell who's more skilled. Having a child that was the result of a less than one month casual relationship was not part of her perfect life. So Brooke kept her secret. A secret that she knew had the ability to destroy her perfect life and all of the plans that she had made. A secret that would forever alter her relationships with the two people that mattered most to her, her mom and Brandon. Look at how she gives her presentation compared to the defense. When Charlie Rickers gave his presentation for the defense, he was, again, calm, collected. He made eye contact with the audience. And he, he looked like he really knew what he was talking about versus when the prosecutor, Julie Kraft, gives her presentation. She's like reading off the script and she's looking up and down, not really making eye contact, doesn't seem as, as sure. And I think this is one of her more crucial mistakes because when she gives her presentation to the jury, she sounds like she's attacking them. She's like, you better believe that this chick is guilty versus the, the defense who is nice and friendly. Who are you going to go with, the friendly person or the person who attacks? And I think the second prosecutor, Stephen Nippon, makes the same mistake as well. Ladies and gentlemen, shortly after murdering her daughter and placing her lifeless body in the dirt behind their home, Brooke Richardson sent two elated text messages to her mother that both contained the phrase, My belly is back. My belly is back. Ladies and gentlemen, that belly was her child. That belly was her daughter. A daughter with fingers and toes, with hair on her head. A child that she tossed into the dirt and didn't even have the decency to wrap her in a blanket to show at least some semblance of respect for that baby girl. And I point this all out because oftentimes when people don't know how to determine what the facts are, they will often rely on the person's demeanor. I mean, look at what people do with presidency. They don't know about politics, so what they say is, well, Obama is a very calm and collected politician, and he sounds like he knows what he's talking about, versus Trump, who they say sounds like a fucking idiot. In fact, that's not the only time the left has done that. When George Bush was president, George Bush Jr., they said he was a bumbling idiot 
versus when Bill Clinton was president, he was the, the best orator on the planet. This demeanor matters, and it certainly matters, I think, a lot to women. And I point that out because the majority of the jurors were females, seven women versus five men. And I think a big part of the defense narrative was a narrative that would more suit women. A big part of the defense was that Brooke Schuyler Richardson was just a helpless child and she was being oppressed by these evil policemen. Now, there's a couple examples of her giving that childlike demeanor, but I think the best is when she gets the verdict. So take a look at this. Would the defendant please rise? With regard to count one, we, the jury in the above caption case, find the defendant, Brooke Schuyler Richardson, not guilty of the offense of aggravated murder. And there appear to be 12 jury uh, signatures affixed. Verdict form two, involuntary manslaughter. We, the jury in the above caption case, do by, hereby find the defendant, Brooke Schuyler Richardson, not guilty of the offense of involuntary manslaughter. Count three, child endangerment. We, the jury, find the defendant, Brooke Schuyler Richardson, not guilty of child endangerment. It does say we further find the defendant did not cause serious physical harm to the alleged victim, but the, uh, that finding is not necessary as a matter of law. <laughs> Verdict form number four, we, the jury, in the above captioned case, find the defendant, Brooke Schuyler Richardson, guilty of the offense of abuse of a corpse. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are those the verdicts of the jury? Yes, sir. You may be seated. All right, again, you are now discharged from all your service. Does either side wish to have the jury polled? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you will be, now be returned to the jury room. Thank you uh, for your service. Mr. Mullins is going to give you back your phones and such, and I will see you uh, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Right from the beginning, you can see her helpless demeanor. I mean, uh, not only does she look scared and nervous, she kind of looks like shit. She kind of looks like she's been through a like a harsh winter or something, and that's likely due to her anorexia. Anorexia will, will make you lose your hair, and it looks like she's losing a little bit of her hair on her, well, it'd be our left side, but her right side. It makes you look older. I've seen uh, a couple people who are anorexic who are in their 20s who look like they're in their 70s. And she's certainly, someone in the comments section of, of one of the videos says she looks like she's in her 40s. I, I certainly agree with that. She looks a lot older than she actually is. And I mean, look look by comparison. Here's, here's a photo of her in the trial. And here's a photo of her in high school when she was a cheerleader. These photos are only a couple years apart. So she looks terrible. She looks panicky. She's crying. She's just this poor, helpless little kid. So you, you get the victim narrative that, that goes very well with women right away. I mean, they, they even push that when they're talking to the police officers about how they, they searched her room. They showed a picture of her, her bedroom looking perfectly clean. And then they showed after the search where it looks super dirty. And the, and the defense lawyer, Charlie Rickers, says, did you, did you clean it up? Did you put it all back? And the cop says, no. And then the assumption was like, well, how terrible is that? You, you messed up her room, you fucked everything up, and you didn't even clean it up. You're, you're ruining the life of this poor, helpless victim. And she even plays the victim card very, very well during her police interrogation. In fact, if I didn't know better, if I didn't know what I know now, and I was doing this 10 years ago, I would have com completely believed her. Just a second, okay? Can I talk to my parents? Um, in, in just a minute, I, but I've got to step out just real quick. And, and I'm not going to stay the night. Come on, honey. You're, you're just, just take a deep breath, okay? I'm going to stay in here with you, okay? Please, just be honest what's going to happen. I don't know, okay? I'm in here observing. Do you? No, 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 no. You're not going to jail. No, no, no. No, and I'm not going to. Just relax, okay? Listen, listen, just relax, okay? Just, I, I don't want to go to jail. I know you don't. Just relax. I don't okay? have to go to jail. Listen, I understand that you're that you're sorry, and I understand that you're upset, and I understand that you didn't want this to happen. Okay, 
Just take some deep breaths, okay? Things will be okay. Do I have to go to jail? You're not going to jail. Okay, we're not taking you to jail today. You're not going to jail, okay? So just What's the worst that's going to happen? Honey, I don't know. This isn't my case, okay? He's talking. He just wants to get some things straightened up so that we can figure out exactly what happened. Are you being 100% honest with him? I'm here. Okay. Now that we've seen our little performance, let me introduce you to somebody named Dahlia DiPolito. You might know her from a case that happened a very long time ago where she called in a hit on her husband. The way this story starts is that she had a one-night stand with a guy named Muhammad Shahadi. During the time that she knew him, she had asked him how to hire someone to put a hit out on her husband. So Muhammad pretty much immediately went to the police for this with this information, and they had asked him to be an informant and try to help them catch her in the act of attempting to hire a hitman to kill her husband. So he said yes to that, and the great thing is, is that they caught it all on tape. Now part of this ruse is that they had to convince her that her husband was dead, and so after she had given the guy uh, a bunch of money to go buy a gun and, and told the guy that she was 5,000% sure that she wanted her husband dead, they had come to her house and had told her that her husband is dead and this is how she responded it's a great performance a newlywed in tears after being told her husband has just been found murdered but those are crocodile tears dahlia dipolito has fallen into a trap the hitman she hired to carry out the murder was actually an undercover cop. I'm positive, like 5,000% sure. Dahlia played the grieving widow for all it was worth. <laughs> or a more interesting thing would be to look at her interrogation. Now I ask you, does this look a little familiar? You're going to jail today for solicitation of murder. You're under arrest. That's an undercover police officer. We filmed everything that you did recorded everything that you did. You're going to jail for solicitation of first degree murder of your husband. I didn't do anything. Did you hear what I just told you? I heard what you said, but I didn't Everything, do anything. listen to me. Everything has been recorded. You were photographed in the convertible when you sat in his car in the front of CVS. What do you want to do? What do you want to do here? I didn't Dying do anything. It? Listen to me. I didn't do anything. You're going to jail. I didn't jail. do anything. Please, I didn't do anything. Don't tell me you didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. You're going to jail today. As soon as I'm done, oh my God. they're going to come in here and handcuff you and take you to the Palm Beach County Jail, book you for solicitation of first-degree murder on your husband. Your husband is well and alive. Thank God. Oh, yeah, thank God. No, he doesn't want to see you. He doesn't want to see you. You better quit your plan. Listen to me. I want you to quit your acting and get this over with. Yes, you are. Okay. You know what? You need a real good attorney. Now, as you're watching this next clip, I want you to think about how she acted during the interrogation and how she acted when she found out that her husband was dead. His mom is not going to be suspicious of you or anything like that. Why me? Let's see. You know what you say somebody that. Nobody's going to be able to point a finger at me. And shortly afterward, gives him a photo of Mike. Why my on top of the pictures? Really? You're going to give him some yeah. fingerprints all over? Quite a different demeanor, isn't it? I mean, this chick was, was absolutely outright arrogant. She was so arrogant that when she got booked and she used her phone call, she called her husband the guy who she tried to kill, and he tr she tried to get him to help her. I'll leave the phone conversation in the description as well as all of the other relevant clips, but during this phone conversation, she pulls one of my favorite lines that any abusive female ma manipulator will use. And if you've listened to this channel long enough, you've probably heard me say this multiple times. But she pulls on the guy she tried to murder. She pulls a variant of, I do so much for you, but you never do anything for me. Explain right. that to me. Right. Why? Right. Why should I? Because you know me. Okay, whatever you do to me, I am there for you, period. You know that. Or am I not? You couldn't even get off the couch the other day, and I came, and I brought you dinner, and I this, and I that, and I always make sure you're always no. there. You're always there. 
Now, to give credit where credit is due, I always like to have things make sense. I like to have the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And to me, it doesn't make sense that this perfectly innocent guy would just end up with a, a cruel murderer who is a complete sociopath. And with a little research, with a little effort, and a little help, I found out the rest of the story. Turns out that Mike DiPolito, the guy who uh, had his wife try to kill him, was a convicted scam artist. So nobody's ever really innocent here. When you're in relationships, you pick the people who you deserve. And, you know, in the case of Brooke Richardson, when you parent, you get the kids you deserve. But I mention this because just like Dahlia, Brooke is extremely arrogant after the crime. After her baby was dead, the next day she sends a text to her mom talking about how great her belly is going to look and that her belly is back. This is compounded with the fact that she basically shows no remorse for her supposedly stillborn child. I've had at least five people in my life who have experienced stillbirths, and every single one of them was devastated by the stillbirth. Brooke constantly tries to refer to the baby as it as opposed to her, as opposed to recognizing it as, a, as an actual human life, and the only time she is really genuinely emotional and genuinely crying is when she's afraid because she doesn't want to go to jail. I think she very effectively uses this fear of going to jail to pull off a very believable cry. And then during the reaction to the interrogation with her parents, she does at least twice do some very manipulative acts. One, she says, can I please hold your hand, mommy? And two, she says, will you always love me? When she does this, she's trying to test if her parents believe her, or she's trying to guilt her parents into believing her. And by the way, don't think for a second that I would ever let the parents off the hook for this situation. The parents are just as bad as she is because they raised a daughter who would do such a thing. Once during the interrogation, she says that she has a good relationship with her parents. But they're going to love you no matter what, and they're going to help you from here on out, okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they're, they're good parents. They will help me. You have a good um, relationship with your mom? Uh, pretty good. Yeah. What about your dad? Um, we just, we work. He's very supportive. Um, I just, we don't know that, that much. Or not as close as me, my mom. Yeah. Now, when she says that, whether she knows it or not, that is an outright lie. If you have a good relationship with your parents, you don't become anorexic. If you have a good relationship with your parents, you don't have unprotected sex and get pregnant. And especially, if you have a good relationship with your parents, you don't become so afraid of telling them that you're pregnant that you have a baby entirely in secret in the middle of the night. Give birth by yourself with zero medical attention. Now, keep in mind, she may not have known this, but in the past, birth without medical attention was a major cause of death. A lot of women died in the past because of childbirth. So she, she does that by herself. She goes, goes through all the pain of childbirth. She buries her dead daughter. She has to bury a corpse. She has to get rid of all of the evidence in the middle of the night. Yet she has a good relationship with her parents. No. No, she doesn't. And that is their fault. So they are not innocent in this situation either. Which brings me to the prosecution. And the judge at the very end of the sentencing says something that I found really interesting. Life is precious, and it should be protected, and it should be guarded in all respects. And I have reviewed all of the expert reports in this case. I listened to the expert's testimony. I firmly believe, Ms. Richardson, in fact, I know in my heart that 
if you would have made different decisions in this case, Annabelle would be here today. And I know that might be difficult for you to hear. Uh, some people are inclined to think to themselves, you know, this is America. We kill unborn babies uh, every day. Uh, but I don't look at it that way, uh, Ms. Richardson. And the law does not allow me to consider the acts that you took prior to uh, giving birth. But I think that your choices before birth, during birth, and after uh, show a grotesque disregard uh, for life. And I think when I look at this case, that to me is what offends uh, the community sensibilities. Uh, but because of policy decisions that are beyond my purview, the jury was not permitted to consider those things, and neither am I. So I don't uh, hold those things uh, against you in the sentencing. In all honesty, I think the judge believes that she is guilty. However, he could not, and he and the jury could not act on that belief because of the laws that have to do with abortion. And there are some things that she did which could not be considered that would really lead you to believe that she is a murderer. But if you went to the doctor and they prescribed you with the pill and then they called because the baby was no longer there, it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't. If they gave you pills and you took it, then that would have killed it, then you're, that's manslaughter. But I didn't do it on purpose. I thought they gave Are you, me the pills. Okay. You're absolutely 100% certain that you went to the doctor and they prescribed the pill to you in April and you started taking them. Yeah. So less than two weeks later, you delivered a stillborn baby. Now, I mentioned earlier that the reason she found out she was pregnant was because she went to the gynecologist to get some birth control. She actually did end up getting the prescription for that birth control, and she took the birth control. Now, this is a pretty key point because she's already pregnant. Why would she need birth control? I think what may have happened is that she thought if she took birth control while she had a baby or while she was pregnant that it might cause a stillbirth or it might kill the baby. However, during the trial, her doctors pointed out that it is very unlikely that taking birth control while you're pregnant will harm the baby. I say this because during the interrogation, she had mentioned that on one of her devices, her computer, her phone, or tablet, or whatever it was, that she looked up how to have an abortion or how to get rid of a baby without a doctor during the third trimester. And certainly this was brought up in evidence, but I don't, I don't know why this wasn't a bigger deal. This is, this is very clear evidence that she wants to kill the child. And I know that the laws are all weird because of abortion, but abortion in the third trimester is illegal. So I would think, even though this was not the case, I would think that any sort of attempt, like her taking birth control and attempt to kill the baby, would be a considered attempted murder because she's passed the legal limit for abortion. To my knowledge, after she found that she was pregnant, she maintained her anorexia despite the fact that when they did some initial tests of the baby, they found it to be perfectly healthy. And think of how sick this is. Her gynecologist advised her on how to go about adoption. He says there's, there's people who will be jumping to adopt your baby. You don't have to take care of this kid. You can find somebody who will take care of him for you. It could be someone who you sign up with. It could be a fam family member or something like that. When you give birth, you're going to be able to find someone who can take care of this child's needs. 11 days after that gynecology visit, she gave birth. Now, I believe three days after the gynecology visit, because she had an aunt or something that worked for that office, her aunt notified the mother, uh, her uh, Brooke's mother, that she was pregnant. And she had a confrontation with her mother and, where her mother said, well, what's this? Someone said you're pregnant. And she says, oh, I don't know what that's about. And she had a chance, had a chance to tell her mother and had a chance to be honest, but she didn't. I think that's a fault of Brooke because this resulted in the death of her baby. And I think this is a fault on her mother because her, Brooke felt so intimidated by her mother that she couldn't talk about anything serious with her. Which brings us to the most unfortunate part of the case for the prosecution and the most fortunate part of the case for the defense is that she gives birth to her, her daughter Annabelle in the middle of the night. Now, 
who who knows what she did that the prosecution tried to say that she burned her but apparently it's not possible to burn someone alive with just a lighter so that that fell through plus when they found the remains you would not have been able to tell if the body was burnt or not even if it had been burnt because when she buried it and waited two months to to get caught basically or to, to tell anybody about the the death by that time any part of the body that could have been used to determine a cause of death like like cremation or burning was already gone, was already decomposed. The only thing that was left were the skeletal remains. In this case, I think it's hard for anything to be proven because probably the most likely option is that she had the baby in the bathroom and she drowned the baby in the toilet. Because think of it this way. It's 12 o'clock at night or it's 1 o'clock in the morning or whatever it is. She does not want her parents to know that she's having a kid. She's gone to great lengths to hide it from everybody, whether she's afraid of her, her mom finding out that she got pregnant. I think that's that was that was the fear. I don't think her dad was too too neurotic. Or she's afraid of everybody at school finding out and thinking that she's a slut or something. But she went to great lengths to hide that she was pregnant. So she has a baby. She gives birth. She makes it through all the pain of childbirth without screaming. And then as soon as her baby comes out, it starts crying. Middle of the night, crying baby. People are going to hear that. So to make it not cry, she suffocates it or she puts her hand over its mouth or drowns it in the toilet. Something that would have been provable if she had been caught before the remains decomposed. I think there are two likely situations here. Either she killed the baby after she was born or she did so many things that, that caused damage to her, her child before the baby was born that she was born a stillbirth, like, again, attempting to uh, not eat or trying to find some back alley abortion technique or maybe punching herself in the stomach so the baby would die. I, I don't think she's innocent at all. There were two slips during this whole event that I found interesting during her interrogation and after the interrogation. There's one during the interrogation where she says she didn't mean to kill her baby. And then after the interrogation, she says to her parents that she would never harm her baby. Well, we know that's not true because during the interrogation, she said that she looked up techniques to be able to abort a child without a doctor. That's hurting the baby. And so there's that. There's a sympathy crime. There's the, will you always love me? There's the testing of her parents to see if they still believe her. But I think the, the most damning thing for me in terms of, of what doesn't make sense about her demeanor and, and what, why it makes a lot more sense that she killed the baby versus it was a stillbirth and she just had a freak reaction, despite the fact of all her, her premeditation for killing the baby before it was born with the, uh, the whole abortion thing and the birth control thing and the anorexia thing, is just the pure amount of distance she sets herself from her child. This is a very, very dangerous thing when you're talking about situations of violence. And let me go on a slight tangent here because I think it helps explain the point. Something that happens quite a lot on Stefan Molyneux's Colin shows is he'll be talking about someone who was pretty ritually abused. And that person might say something like, well, my parents love me. And Stefan will always respond in this situation, no, they didn't. Because if you love somebody, if you love something, you can't hurt them. You can only, you can only hurt things that you hate. People don't just cause extreme harm to things that they love. In fact, people often don't cause extreme harm to things that they're, they're neutral about or they don't really care much for. In fact, that was actually a really big problem back in the 1940s in Germany. Uh, our, our certain German leader, who I can't mention because this is YouTube, but our certain German leader had a lot of trouble getting his soldiers to commit murder. He would say, okay, we got we to gotta exterminate this entire town. And people would, would, they would get their weapons, they'd go to the town, and they would they would they would fire at the people and they'd miss on purpose. Or they'd get drunk or they they'd they'd flee the battle site. So after a while they got very good at getting soldiers to harm other people. And I say this as a warning for people who are trying to manipulate you into abusing somebody else. So what they did when soldiers refused to kill is they would try to distance the soldiers away from the people they were killing. One of their methods was to round everybody up 
and then have them face face down in the dirt, and they would have the soldiers shoot them in the back of the head so they didn't have to look them in the eyes they were killing them. That made it way easier to get the soldiers to kill innocent people. Another method they used to get soldiers to kill innocent people was to, um, this is actually probably the favorite method, was to go into a building where they had suspects in the building, and they would chuck a grenade in that building, kill everybody in the building or, or severely wound them, and then they would just leave. That way, they don't have to see anybody at all. It is easy to cause harm to things that you hate or things that you're distant from. This is why this is why abortion is a thing. It's, it's abortion if you're inside the womb, and it's murder if you're outside the womb. It's murder in both cases, but the reason it is not murder when you're inside the womb is because you can't see the baby. When you can see the baby, it's murder. When you can't, it's not. It's not about the morality. It's about the distance. Brooke Schuyler Richardson seemed to have done everything possible that she could to distance herself from the baby by calling it it, by really not showing any emotion for the death, by only really focusing on her her being incarcerated or not, not really focusing on the baby's well-being, didn't really seem to care about the child at all, which makes it very likely that she was capable of harming the baby. And we have evidence that she was capable of harming the baby because she took birth control, even though the birth control didn't do anything, uh, she took birth control in an attempt to still, bo- still birth the baby. But I guess none of that matters. It, it didn't matter that she showed zero motivation for protecting the baby. It didn't matter that she showed every single reason to kill that child. It didn't matter that she attempted an abortion during the third trimester, which is illegal. For some reason, that evidence had to be thrown out. And well, I guess she pulled an O.J. Simpson on this one and got away with murder. And that's enough for this video. If you liked it, hit the like button. Subscribe if you're new. Comment and share. If you'd like to support the channel, then you can do so by either donating through PayPal or Subscribestar, both those links are in the description. And so far, that money's going right back into the channel. Uh, thanks to previous donations over the past couple months, I have now purchased a copy of Adobe Premiere, and the editing in this, these videos is going to get quite a bit better over the upcoming months because of that. So thanks to the people who have donated so far and allowed me to improve my channel. Last thing, if you have not subscribed to my BitChute channel yet, then you can do so by following the link in the description. Other than that, thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.